Welcome to the Total Connected Show. My name is Kevin Navani. My very special guest today is Stefan Oliveira. I don't need to introduce you, Stefan. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, listen, uh, Stefan, I mean, I've been, you know, following you for, I don't know for how long, you know, listening to your podcasts and uh, your, your, the, the depth and the spectrum of your, of the knowledge of the content you deliver is just amazing. And I mean, you admitted it yourself that in your podcast, most of it, you know, because I, I do follow on, you know, I can follow the, most of the content, but some of them I'm like, I don't know the fuck what, what, what you guys are talking about, you know, on a technical, <laughs> economical level, because you admitted yourself, it's like, you know, most or a lot of it is for intermediate, advanced people. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I'm not comparing myself, you know, to, to you or people even like Peter McCormack. So I'm trying to be a complimentary part for newbies. Uh, who are open-minded, interested, who are potentially, you know, want to go into the Bitcoin space and really comprehend the bigger picture. So mm. I don't want to bring up any kind of points that you have already, you know, discussed really in awesome depth with your, uh, with your guests. Um, but there is one point which I try to, you know, discuss this with other Bitcoiners, but they just scratch the surface and I can't go into deep, deep into it. Uh, I don't need to, you know, um, uh, uh, introduce this book for, but most people, you know, the Bitcoin standard, there is on this page 96 to 98. Uh, it's about the comparison between the gold standard and the fiat standard, 19th and 20th century. And, and the, and the original innovations that took place in the 19th century and the adaptation optimization for in improvements in the 20th century. Now, I want to, you know, somehow uh, connect the dots with you together um, uh, because it goes back again to the question, why Bitcoin? Um, I mean, we talk about, you know, about the very theoretical, economical, which is totally, you know, substantially important to understand. But do you have like any thoughts or, or how would you explain to, you know, to let's say, because, you know, my intention is to uh, speed up the, 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 the rate of mass adoption. Uh, I, because we, you were just uh, you were just tweeting with P Peter McCormick just recently a few minutes ago about hodlers, you know, hodlers of rasp sort, and that's you know this is what we need, right? We need mass adoption. We need actually what we need is a is a exponential mass adoption of hodlers. So, yeah. could you tie this all together uh, with time preference, future orientation, and I know one of your favorite uh, economists is Hulsman. Uh, and oh, I just yeah. watched a video about the cultural transformation, uh, bad money or fiat money compared to hard money. And I think, you know, it all ties together. And I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, to connect the dots, not only for myself, but also, you know, for the listeners, for the viewers. Why Bitcoin? I mean, because I see a future in whatever, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, hopefully sooner than later, where I think we're going to have a human civilization on the Bitcoin st standard on the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, which will, I think, which will just, uh, you know, create totally new structures. I mean, totally new evolutionary structures on scientific level, technological level, social level, economical level, what have you. Okay, I'm gonna shut up now and let you talk, please. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Um, so a few things I would just touch on to comment from what you were just saying there. Firstly, I think there is still a lot of confusion. We are in 2019. Some of the very, as I mentioned, some of the very foundational level explanatory articles and books were written five plus years ago, right? So that literally, uh, that uh, thing I was just, you, you were referring to, the thing that you just retweeted me on, was uh, actually referring to an article from 2013, right? And so fundamentally, there's just still a lot of confusion because the, it takes time for people to understand this thing and not everybody will understand it at an intellectual level. Other people will just grasp it at a more, Oh no, I need to, I need to preserve my value when it's too late. Right. And unfortunately there's only so many people that you can teach explicitly at an intellectual level. This is why it is better. A lot of people are basically it, to put it simply, people are going to have to learn the hard way. Some people a lot of people and that's unfortunate we're doing our best to try and teach people but sometimes people are just not ready right it's like that um i don't know if you've heard that saying when the student is ready the teacher appears right yeah. it's it's sort of like that there's a lot of students out there and they're just not ready 
So they haven't done the reading. They haven't read these different things. And obviously we've had a lot of charlatans in this so-called cryptocurrency space, uh, inverted commas there, right? Um, but I, the key thing in, in, when it comes to this idea of hodlers and so on, right? So some people are thinking, oh, is liquidity meaning like lots of people trying to you know, do trades in Bitcoin? right? Like merchant adoption, right? And this is calling back, hearkening back to the 2013 and 14 days when people were basically going to a merchant, trying to yell at them to get them to take Bitcoin. And they would spend the money to integrate Bitcoin into their technology stack. And then guess what? Not that many people actually spent their Bitcoins. Reason being, more people want to hold. More people are speculating that this thing is going to be worth so much more. Now, that said, there is a role for Bitcoin spending today. It's just that most people kind of rationally are uh, preferencing towards hod hodling right now. Yes, some people will spend and that will maybe for different reasons. Maybe that's for censorship resistance reasons. Maybe they've been shut down. Uh, another reason might simply be the, uh, the additional privacy that can come with using Bitcoin and the lightning network, because you can, particularly when you are buying digital goods, because now the merchant does not need to collect as much information about the customer. They can literally just say, I don't need your real name, your real address, your real, all that. Just, you know, put a fake name and put an email. I'll deliver you the content on an email. Or in some cases, it's just delivered on the website right then and there. It's like these little small website article, view the article for one cent sort of thing. So no one cares about getting an email for it, right? That, that's potentially what I see. But I think bringing it back to the broader overall point the liquidity we care about is the hodler network effect, right? So on my podcast, uh, a couple of different episodes, uh, 76 with VJ Boyapati, mm -hmm. recent episode, uh, 111 with Bitstein. We touch, we talk about some of these points and the key way I would summarize it is the most important network effect is the hodler one, right? Now, other network effects matter too, right? Having merchants and so on also matter, but I would say the key, the most underlying one, the most powerful network effect, if you will, is the hodler one. This relates to the concept, as I'm sure you're aware, in Austrian economics where, say, Murray Rothbard refers to reservation demand in man, economy, and state, right? So that's, that's how I'm thinking of this, right? Now, to the other point, one other point I wanted to touch on there was... Obviously, guys like you and me and many other Bitcoiners, we're doing what we can to try and teach people that fundamentally, I don't think there's that much we can do to speed the process. Like we can speed it on the margin, but I don't think we can speed the overall process because it's, it's just a function of time and it's a function of proving itself out, right? Sometimes Bitcoin just needs time spent alive such that people now start to think, Oh, it's been around long enough. It's part of the furniture. It's not going away. It's a reg it's a common thing. It's a household name in society. All of these things take time. And so I think that is fundamentally why some people are sort of thinking a little too actively, if you will. Right. And we should think of this more like Hayek said, it's more like uh, a product of human action, but not of human design. That's one way I would think about it as well. Phraxology, right? Is that the word? The study of human action? The Phraxology? Is that the word? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Phraxology, well, you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're spot on, uh, Stefan, because uh, the thing is, I always say, okay, people uh, like in, you know, Turkey, Venezuela, Iran, where there is the pain, the suffering, the social, economical, financial pain, they feel you don't need to do much explanation because out of necessity comes creativity and action, right? 100%. So, but uh, I mean, we should be, I'm, I'm like, okay, maybe we should be grateful for all this bullshit that's like happening right now with ma geopolitical, macroeconomically, negative interest rate policy, quantitative easing, trade wars, currency wars. I mean, I don't know what's going on right now behind the scenes. We just know a fraction of that. But if that, if those external factors um, speed up, that would eventually, actually they're doing us or the, the Bitcoin um, a favor. Uh, so maybe all these things, if, if falling in place, people are going to somehow feel it coming, you know, They're like, okay, how I'm going to store my wealth uh, in what kind, you know, of, of asset or, you know, then they start thinking, then they have the pain, the suffering or whatever, the, the contemplation, and then they go into the, you know, into action. And this is my hope. Right. And so I think Safety touches on this in some of his recent talks as well, where he is saying, in some sense, Bitcoin, the demand for it 
may in some sense be dependent on government doing the intervention and central banks doing the things that they're doing and bailouts and legal tender laws and all of these things that uh, in some sense create this bad monetary environment that we live in today. And so he's essentially making this argument that part of it though is that we could, we should expect them to continue doing that. And from our point of view, if we're Bitcoiners, well, I think of it like it's giving Bitcoin just a little bit more runway. It's giving Bitcoin a little bit more chance for people to try and adopt it and start using it like a real economy. And so we, I think, I guess, speaking purely in terms of Bitcoin adoption and what's best for Bitcoin, I think probably, in so, I know it might not sound nice, but it's sort of like if the governments keep the house of cards running for a little bit longer, then that theoretically is better for Bitcoin, in my view, rather than letting it all crash now, if that makes sense. So what we're seeing is easing by central banks, right? They are lowering the interest rates. They are doing different interventions into the market. And those are, to some extent, helping prop up the house of cards that we live in today. And so it's obviously not ideal. The ideal, obviously the ideal, you know, yeah, it, theoretically, like if it could be done, the government should just get out of the market for money. Everyone goes back to a gold standard and there's no further intervention from then on. However, we know that's not the way the game plays out, right? Because gold as a technology, as Safety and explains, is vulnerable to being centralized into vaults and it is politically vulnerable, then we would expect another round of you know, shenanigans by the government, right? They will start doing these games of setting the price of gold and then as occurred in 1971, the suspension of specie redemption, meaning, uh, just for the listeners, meaning you can't take those dollars back to the, um, you know, back to the bank to redeem them for gold, right? That, that link was permanently severed. And then essentially what that does is it puts us into a world of truly fiat money, tr like bare fiat money, barely by the decree of the state, as opposed to having some semblance of control or sorry, rather semblance of connection to gold and backing by gold, so to speak. So uh, yeah, in a nutshell, central banks and the government are likely to keep intervening to keep the house of cards running. And from our point of view as Bitcoiners, it's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, um, the, th the thing is, okay, I mean, as, as, as also Safed and other economists say, that we, we haven't had a, a hard money, not even our parents or grandparents know actually what it's like living on a hard money. I mean, that, that is, I mean, totally because the decoupling, I didn't even know that as, uh, once I read, uh, you know, Safedan's book, that the decoupling of gold already started in 1914, of course, no coincidence, the start of World World War, because how else are you going to, you know, finance the war? Um, so... Uh, going back to my first question, uh, so if if we now if we go a little bit, I, I know we we cannot make predictions, you know, but but um, let's let's suppose we have a uh, total ossification, monetary root layering, as I would call it, of Bitcoin in whatever in decades to come. Uh, what kind of structural developments or evolution do you see? I mean, on because uh, because in the, what's the essence of 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 Bitcoin for you, uh, Stefan? Isn't um, I, do, when you say ossification, are you referring to Bitcoin protocol ossifying, like yeah, that point, or yeah, are you referring that, to okay? No, both. Yeah, I mean, I was so, as well as ossification as, and then on the other hand, the sort of the the the, the mass adoption, if you want, want to call it, a monitor root layering. We have like I don't know, maybe the, I don't know what the trigger could be, and that that would be an interesting question. What is the critical number for mass adoption? Is that is that in your eyes like half a billion? Is that billion? Uh, you know. Um, so it triggers the chain reaction. I, I I'm sorry. I, I don't think I can really tell you in terms of uh, how what's the critical number. I I just see it like more and more people are just coming. It's going to be like one of those slowly then suddenly things. Uh, in terms of like where that point is, vertical curve. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sort of. But I mean, for now, we're, we're, we haven't hit the knee of that curve yet. Mm -hmm. So we're still kind of looking like we're growing very slowly. But if you advanced 15, 20 years from now, it would have gone you know we might have who knows we might have already gone through much of it by then mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um but in terms of the monetary root layer or, 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 you know as you were saying maybe it looks well 
hopefully if we get certain technologies into Bitcoin, so like Schnorr signatures and L2 and SIG hash no input and some of these different technologies that we're hoping to see, then hopefully we see some kind of multi-party channels uh, uh, lightning future. And we could see some of these other ideas as well. So Ruben Somson's state chains idea as well. And so these are some ideas that might really take Bitcoin scaling just to the next, like to the completely next, next level. Even now, now to be fair, I think even as it is today, it might still be enough. Even if we never got some of those really crazy advanced things, it might still be enough. It, it would probably require there being enough so-called free market banks, right? Full reserve free market banks who provide that settlement layer service or they are the ones pr uh, transacting on the Bitcoin settlement layer. And, you know, retail individuals like you and me are just transacting on the layers above that, like set up by these free market banks. Now the question, and this is the open question, is whether those banks would remain resistant enough to government coercion, control, influence, etc. Now that's an open question. I don't think anyone really has an answer for that because hey, no one's got a crystal ball. However, it you know, we could we might surmise that there will be enough and we might surmise that there will be jurisdictional competition between the different countries of the world as they exist today. I mean, what have we got? 196 or whatever how however many countries we've got in the world. My hope is that that number dramatically goes up right? So the idea is smaller is better. We want to see smaller and smaller and smaller. Obviously, I, you know, uh, coming from that more anarcho-capitalist view, I think, you know, ideal would be, hey, people can secede right down to the individual. But I don't think we'll get that. I would like to see it. But I think maybe we'll see more like city states and like lots and lots and lots of little small city states. And hopefully that is enough to provide some level of decentralization and some kind of check against each other that there's so many little small ones that it's not a huge deal. And if any one of them starts acting out or charging too much for its services, then people can just move to somewhere else and people will have more advanced technology such as multi-signature with Bitcoin and they can secure their Bitcoins in that way and they can, keep even keys in, in across different jurisdictions to try and reduce the political risk and in doing so avoid what may be you know loosely stated as the failures of gold right the fa quote unquote the failures of gold to restrain the government and keep it in check that's how i would think of it mm -hmm. great um do you think because you know there's this uh, always uh, even under uh, even with a uh, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoiners Austrian economists or Bitcoin Maxim there's this uh, you always uh, you often hear this disclaimer well Bitcoin could still fail I'm like mm, I'm not sure uh, do we have as Bitcoin community do we do we ourselves have enough conviction that it's going to just make it I mean it, we have no other choice. I'm like, that's my first question. Do I mean, is it, why this disclaimer? I mean, I know it's, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, I get that when, when people say it's not financial advice, I get that. But why would we say, you know, Bitcoin would still fail? I, that's, I think it's just, it's just showing humility about the future, right? It's hard to come out and say, yeah, Bitcoin is going to live forever, right? Um, but I, I just, I can't, right now, I can't see any reason why, it would not live to the live, you know, not forever, but for a long, long time. Uh, I just, I don't see, I don't see it right now. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's, um, there's something we haven't thought about. Maybe there is some kind of completely catastrophic thing that happens in a few years from now. And it's all over that way. I don't know. Because and, we and have no guarantee. That, we have no guarantee, yeah. right? I that's mean, right. And I think it's anything. ultimately, yeah, that's right. I mean, ultimately, you, you never know whether your government it is today becomes a really tyrannical one tomorrow. You never know that, right? And fundamentally, you just have to, you know, do the best you can and uh, move on with life, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah there's, not a, there's not much I can really say about that. I think it's, it's just basic humility. 
but the recreation, let's say, because we know already how, how we could recreate Bitcoin, but the, uh, what do you call it? The immaculate, who, who, who termed that? Co uh, who I'm not sure term? if it was Nick Carter or Safe Dean or, or maybe or Marty Bent or one of these guys, one of these guys like sort of coined it and helped popularize that idea of the immaculate conception. Immaculate inception, yeah. And I'm like, well, we could recreate it, but the conditions are not there anymore. That's so right. And what that, we've seen is a lot of these basically shit coins who try to be, you know, do their own thing and none of them achieve the same thing. Right. And that's why some people in Bitcoin think that, look, it's Bitcoin or bust, right? They think it's, it's got to make it this time. Yeah. If such a thing were to, if it were to fail, the chances of it might be dashed for who knows decades before someone comes up with a new way and it's not just another shit coin. Right. Who knows? Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's a really speculative point, and I I really honestly I don't know enough to speak intelligently on that. Yeah, well, because you know the conditions. Uh, whenever wh whoever you know, in, wh whenever uh, Satoshi Nakamura came up, but uh, it's like the conditions were there. People were not, or nobody was paying attention. So all these conditions, the situation was the you know was totally uh, sort of. Uh, uh, not known or you know not being paid attention to so the question we, uh, this is why i'm saying do we have any other choice than bitcoin uh, for, there right is now other choice we got to make i it. don't think so yeah but i mean again maybe you're asking the wrong person right because obviously i'm i'm huge into bitcoin i'm really you know i'm bullish on bitcoin okay. i part of it though is you know i just thought there's no chance of making the government smaller through standard political action and there's very little hope of actually convincing people about libertarianism right uh it just not it's not going to happen so fundamentally if you want the government to be smaller i think bitcoin is the only way you're going to get that or at least the only realistic way right mm -hmm. in in our lifetimes now yeah. maybe maybe there's a case about this whole idea of um you know parenting and like long super long term if you were to try and teach your children in such a way that mm -hmm. they are more you know, adequately skeptical of the government and then they teach their children and hopefully, you know, maybe there's some way out that way. But I, I just, I just don't think people appreciate the water that we're swimming in and the world that we're in that you just, you can't, it, there needs to be this sort of improvement in freedom technology, whether that, you know, whether that is Bitcoin and other technologies that can help privacy such as encryption and so on. I think really that's the way this has to go. That's the only way that can actually force the matter rather than just leaving it all to the trust or the chance, right? Because fundamentally, if you leave it to chance, it's just going to keep going the way it's been going, which is more and more interventionist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree totally. Um, <clears throat> what do you think are the, um, are the biggest challenges for understanding? What, what are the biggest misconceptions that people have a problem with? So with Bitcoin, I think a big one for most people is volatility. They think, oh, it's really volatile. Why would anyone use it? Why would anyone price their contracts directly in Bitcoin? Right now, people are denominating contracts typically in US dollar or some other you know, fiat money. So I think that's a big one for people. The other one is just why should they care? Some other people think the government will shut it down. I don't think so, obviously, but that's, that's a common one that you see some people say. Um, otherwise, I think it's just also, it's one of those things where Bitcoin requires, and I've mentioned this before, but Bitcoin requires some level of technical understanding and some level of economic understanding. And sometimes you have to, that's rare. So sometimes you really have to spend a lot of time with someone to get them to the point where they've got enough understanding on both sides that they can confidently start learning about Bitcoin and then buying Bitcoin and stacking sats, right? Like all of us, all of the hardcore Bitcoiners are doing. So that fundamentally is a journey and it takes time. And sometimes it's not even purely an intellectual one. Sometimes it's also an emotional one. So sometimes it's sort of like what I noticed with some people is it's almost like an emotional switch turns in their mind, right? It's sort of like the scales fall from their eyes kind of moment when they start thinking, Oh, whoa, hang on the government has been basically robbing me this whole time and it's been really causing all these negative impacts on society and it's causing all these problems and spying on everyone and doing all these terrible, terrible things that if the government was an individual, we would never allow that sort of thing. Oh, but yeah. people yeah. allow it because it's the government and they think because in their minds, they're thinking, oh, the government is on my side. They don't think of it like the government 
can is different from society. I empathize right? so with that. I empathize with that a lot because I'm like, you know, this is a belief system, or I don't know, some kind of brainwashing that we've all gone through. You know, some of us, you know, went deeper or early into the rabbit hole, but like understanding and then going, you know, zooming out of the rabbit hole and then understanding, accepting the reality as it is, you know, we don't need, you know, to dwell too much into the problems or the causes, but I think every one of us should understand the cause, right? The, the core causes of, of the symptoms that's, that we are, you know, in this totally, you know, psychopathic world, to be honest with you. I mean, everything that we talk about with its government, the central banks, uh, the institutions, the media, it is, it is pretty hardcore, I think, pretty much traumatizing, I think, for a lot of people waking up to the fact that, oh, uh, you know, we've been stolen from and, uh, I don't know, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, defrauded and, and manipulated and betrayed. It, I think it must be pretty traumatizing for a lot of people, you know. Yeah, I think so. That's definitely, I think that's the thing that a lot of libertarian people face. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, you don't have to be a libertarian to get into Bitcoin. And I think that is also a point that's well worth raising because there are a bunch of progressives as well who are into Bitcoin because they think of it like we still need to separate money and state. Mm -hmm. But what I do tend to notice is that in the Bitcoin world, if you will, there are different subgroups and typically the Bitcoin progressives don't play as well with the Bitcoin libertarians and the Bitcoin obviously vice versa as well, right? They tend to not be as close, right? It's, so it's, but that said, that we have common ground, right? The idea is we want to separate money and state. And I think that is something that basically every Bitcoiner can agree on, right? Like otherwise you wouldn't really be a Bitcoiner, right? Um, but there may be very differing conceptions of what you believe the government should do, right? Now, I'm a libertarian, but obviously recognizing from a progressive point of view that they, they want a large state. They want a large, you know, they want, you know, social provision from their point of view. It's like they want social provision of X, Y, and Z, right? And it's not... Um, you know, you'll see even in like some core developers and different, uh, you know, kind of senior or kind of well-respected people within Bitcoin who are not necessarily libertarian, right? So that's another point that bears, you, we have to consider that as well, right? Because not everyone is like an Austro-libertarian uh, in that sort of uh, mold, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um. <clears throat> To be honest with you, I don't have any more questions, <laughs> Stefan. But, yeah, sure. But still, going back to my very first question, do you see, I mean, once, once we have that, you know, that future uh, on, on the, really on a Bitcoin star, a majority, because it's not going to go like, it's going to be a transition phase. But what, what kind of society or civilization are we going to have? This is my, like, my most curious question. Yeah, so for me, I... Again, being careful not to be utopian about it, but I think it will be far, far more productive and prosperous. We will likely orient the production in society in a much more efficient way that aligns with our actual preferences. And in doing so, it, it, I think, uh, you know, as you were uh, mentioning uh, earlier offline, uh, the Guido Holzman talk, the cultural consequences of fiat money, which is a very important point in some ways, because it has, fiat money has corroded a lot of our morals and our ethics in society. And I know that sounds like, to an outsider, that might sound very crazy and people who think, oh, you just think Bitcoin is the answer to everything. You crazy Bitcoiners, you think Bitcoin fixes this about everything, right? <laughs> and yeah, in our view, it's just people have not actually gone to the level of study to realize what these fiat money and government institutions do to society and what they do to the moral fiber of a nation or of a people that they t turn people who were once about self-reliance and also about voluntarily helping each other and making the world a better place. It becomes more about who can control the guns of the government and who can push their costs onto other people and make the government enforce that and who can basically benefit from that system and who will rise to the top in that kind of system. And it will be these very nasty, bad sort of people who rise to the top in this typical politically driven world. Whereas if less things were about politics, if more things were just decided on an individual level, we would see a lot less uh, 
conflict and we would see a lot less graft and a lot less sort of corruption and uh, inappropriate use of this massive power of the government. And so I think we would see a much smaller government. We would see basically no welfare state. We would see private everything, right? Whether that's roads, police force, fire, fire, um, you know, healthcare, the cost for everything would be dramatically falling. And in a good, you know, that's a good thing, right? So people would be able to vastly afford much more high quality healthcare, better education, better every, everything. And we may reach a point where, you know, some people may choose to, in some sense, you know, only work very few hours, right? So typically they might not choose to work 40 hours a week. They might just only work a day a week. And then they've, because we'd be living in a much richer society, maybe yeah. they would then uh, be able to do that. Now on the, the flip side of that is maybe there'd be a lot of people who choose to do something, you know, and it's more about a passion, right? So it's more about they can live, they can be an artist or whatever, and because society is so wealthy, it's so rich by then, it actually becomes more about things like creativity and about ability to uh, sort of intellectually manipulate different things as opposed to like physical labor because like maybe robots and machinery would handle a lot of these things and it becomes more about, you know, maybe your programming skill or your creativity or your people skills. And so th these are just a couple of different ideas. And I think it might become more of a society where, People choose jobs and, if you will, careers, uh, not so much for the, you know, I need to work this super high paying job because I got to pay this mortgage to pay. And like, oh, daycare is so expensive for the kids because the government made occupational licensing so high that the daycare cost is ridiculous and the cost of living is so ridiculous. I think people would sort of go more towards like natural passion careers, right? If they're an, ins if they're a musician or wh whatever other way, I think those are many different factors that people would now play into their own mind in terms of how they think about what they want to do with their life and what they do with their time. Obviously, as you know, the time, time is our most scarce thing that we have. So it's about finding things that are really worthwhile for you to do and, Another key thing that I think if you listen to some lectures by Guido Holzman, he mentions a few things around this that, you know, pre all this sort of monetary craziness, it was the idea that if you wanted something, you would save up and buy it as opposed to now where it's very common to go into debt to get things, right? So I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast many times as well as this idea of basically living in a society that is more equity based as opposed to debt based. So we're going to have, you know, more of an idea that you save up for something and then you buy it rather than buy it on credit and then pay off the debt. Uh, so, and we would see that ripple out into so many other things as well. So many companies that exist today would likely not be, uh, the structure would be very different, right? Yep. The equity and the debt structure of these companies would be totally different. Uh, so yeah, but on, on the whole, we would live in a much more prosperous society. They're not perfect. Yeah. And as uh, Hulsman, I think, said in his, one of his talks I just watched recently, he said something about people, you know, uh, in order to understand uh, what it's like, uh, or something like that, I'm just maybe paraphrasing it wrongly, but uh, he said, like, we have to zoom out and not only watch, you know, uh, um, uh, analyze the last 10 years, but we have to really zoom out and because people are, we are, we're also conditioned to this artificial state, it's not natural economy. So once we go into this, nat I don't know, maybe I'm paraphrasing it uh, differently, but maybe we have to go into this natural state of economy. And before I forget that point, you, you said something important because this fiat system, you know, I mean, it, it is, um, uh, why do we have all these wars? The military industrial complex, the technology that is being, you know, uh, with black budgets, finance and everything. And I'm seeing a future where all these technologies that are either, you know, being confiscated in the name of national security or patented, these are all gonna come out and really for the first time, maybe, you know, come out into the civil area and, and, and serve humanity for the first time. So this is also, you know, when you said prosperity, uh, I'm like, what if we have really a scientific technological prosperity for the first time? I mean, maybe things we can't even imagine at this moment, but this is, uh, you know, going back, you know, why Bitcoin to the question, why Bitcoin? This is, I think it will just free up all these structures that have been so, you know, either compartmentalized or, you know, black budgeted or non not acknowledged. I mean, uh, I think in the last decades, uh, over 5,000 patents have been, confiscate in the name of national security alone in the United States. So 
I'm like, you know, what, what's the essence of Bitcoin? Uh, essence of Bitcoin is, is freedom. I mean, do we agree on that, right? Right. Yeah, I think the key thing with that, and this comes back to some of Stefan Kinsella's work, who I've had on the podcast, I think episode 15 or around there. Um, but he talks about this idea of intellectual property as really just being a, if you will, a machination or a, a, a creation or an aberration caused by the government. And again, massively hinders human progress. And so a really good book for the listeners, if they're interested, is that it's called Against Intellectual Monopoly by um, Michelle and Baldron, I think. The last names are Michelle and Baldron. Michelle with one L. But yeah, so really great book because he in that book, they both spell out that uh, certain patents and different intellectual property, so-called laws, have delayed humanity by years and years and years because <laughs> people just waste this time in the courts and basically blocking up innovation because everyone's stuck waiting for some other thing to, um, uh, you know, uh, for... Yeah, basically because somebody's blocking up the innovation, stopping them from building on each other's ideas, right? Because they say, no, I've got the patent, so you've got to pay me a licensing fee and all this other BS, right? Um, but with that, it, what it also does is it causes people to do these silly workarounds because then they, and then they play the, the, all the games of like trying to make their invention just slightly different enough that they're not breaching the patent. And it just, it just causes all these silly game, you know, fun and games, basically. Everyone plays all these games rather than just actually getting on with the job of trying to satisfy consumer desires, which is ultimately what we should all be trying to do with whatever product or service that we provide. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's a danger, of course, to the established, um, for example, you know, oil industry or, you know, uh, combustion engine industry. What if we have technology that, you know, will, will exponentially, you know, move us forward in the, in the field of transportation? You know, I mean, I don't want to go into science fiction right now, but what if, what if all these technologies are out there already and Bitcoin could be, I mean, maybe Bitcoin really fixes this, you know, for the first time because it will free up all these, you know, uh, I don't know, let's just call it theft systems, criminal structures. I don't know what to call it, you know, compartmentalized structures. Um, so this is, um, this, is, this is the most, I think, fascinating and, um, and, and most thrilling thing I, um, uh, Bitcoin is, you know, will eventually solve because without uh, a healthy foundation, without a healthy soil, how can how how else are we going to you know build up the ecosystems, the economical technological ecosystems upon it? Um, yeah. Yeah. So there, I guess you're right. I think there would be a lot more innovation and you a, a very rapid advancement in our technology stack of humanity if we were sort of throwing off the shackles of basically the you know the government and their kind of use and squandering of resources uh, but in terms of specific technologies i you know i couldn't really tell you but i think yeah certainly i think we would see a lot better you know whatever tra tra transport technology and you know telecommunications technology and fundamentally right now some of the infrastructure of of humanity is very corrupted right so for example a lot of the internet stuff is very um it can be surveilled right so it can all be spied on who knows maybe it would be built in a more privacy respecting way as well. Whereas right now governments are always trying to put in the back door for things. They're trying to say, Oh, WhatsApp and Facebook, give us a back door to your messenger software or we'll ban you or we'll you know, tax you or we'll do something to you. Right. And then what, what do they do? Well, they have to, they have to cave. They have to, otherwise they get shut down. So it just becomes this ridiculous game. So, I mean, okay, there's, there's a little bit more to it than that. So, for example, maybe Mark Zuckerberg has some ability to sway back against state leaders and so on. So, obviously, it's a bit of a complicated game there. But the fundamental point is that government has this massive power that, is, that it should not have. And it should be free enterprise uh, contracting with each other and making voluntary agreements with each other. That is the way we view it as working under a private property ethic. Mm -hmm. Great. So, <clears throat> um, Stefan, uh, would you would you want to talk a little bit about your educational platform, Ministry of Notes, which you're doing with uh, Ketan Gulabdas, yeah. your colleague yeah. here? 
because I think it's great what you guys are doing. I wish it would, that would be available, you know, and more language should be actually, you know, these education platforms, the workshops should be translated into different languages, like, you know, all these books. Um, so yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, so uh, a couple of things with that. So we are basically, we started that with, um, basically with articles and we have also some videos on the YouTube page. So we've started with some of those and we have also been running some workshops for people. Um, so some were just with like a, pri like a private session with some individuals who wanted private coaching. Uh, and then another one was just like a, just like a straight up workshop uh, for, you know, open to people. So we are looking at different things in terms of what we're going to do with that and how to advance it. We have, you know, so it's still very early days with that though, because, you know, for me, my podcast is my main uh, time. You know, it's, that's my main, that's most of my time is spent on the podcast. And for my co-founder Katan, he's still got a day job, right? So he's still working that job. Uh, and it's likely to stay that way. Uh, although obviously our passion is to try and educate. And I think one guiding philosophy that we would think about or try and explain is just this idea that people need to be handheld. And so we want there to be very high quality guides, walkthroughs, videos on how people can come into Bitcoin and learn Bitcoin the right way. So that was one big if you will, a gap in the market that we believe we spotted. And that's what we're trying to help serve. We're trying to help people learn the right way rather than what they might do is when they search online, they find someone who's a, you know, crypto expert or whatever, and then they'll tell them about, you know, how to buy all these shit coins and the focus is wrong as well. So you'll see some of these people, they'll get on line and they will see, you know, some shit coin pumper basically. And, that person will then teach them how to trade, right? Or teach them how to, you know, basically buy different shit coins. And it just becomes ridiculous. The whole thing, it just becomes like a waste of time. So um, I think the way it's gonna uh, come back is like, just people will slowly but surely come around. And the way we are treating it is one at a time. Right, you just get one person, one at a time. Just try and get them, try and teach them, try and get them in the right way, and then they will, you know, if they really care, then they will teach their family or their friends. And so, it's not the fastest, it's not the most scalable thing, but sometimes that is the most uh, effective thing. Is sometimes you have to just spend the time and invest it with an individual person and try to coach them through. And one thing that I found as well, just as part part of trying to teach people, is it's very easy to bombard someone with resources and you really have to sort of think, okay, assess what level they are at technically and economically, and then assess the next step and say, okay, here is the next step for you. Like read this book or listen to this podcast episode or watch this video or install this software and try running it or you get a hardware wallet, different steps, right? So I think of it like it's a progression step and you try and take them. Okay. You're at this level. Okay. Now what's the next step? So that is how I'm, thinking of it there are different approaches obviously right so there are some you know companies out there uh, you know so for example someone like casa for example they are trying to sort of get you all the way through by having a node a node product and so on and so i mean there's different philosophies on it right so there are different ways and we're just trying to provide different options that will give people a way to quickly learn in a cheap way so we'll, we'll see what see what we can do about you know, trying to scale our offering if we can online, but we haven't, we haven't, we, we are exploring that, but it's just a bit of a, you know, at this point, it's more like our, we just need some time to figure out exactly how to do that. No, I love your approach. I mean, uh, it's really overdue. I mean, education is like the ultimate thing to do. Uh, what, what I'm interested in, what's your, I mean, what's your demographically, uh, what kind of people approach you i mean how old are they where do you come from what's the background i mean do you have like an idea where they come from well some of them are it's like similar to the demographics of my podcast so mm -hmm. it's probably you know guys in their let's say mid 20s through to maybe 50s or so uh maybe mid 40s maybe some in the 50s as well um so it's it's just kind of that demographic and typically like I was mentioning before, they tend to be people uh, 
of a higher intellect, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like it's like people who are into Bitcoin and people who are like listening to my podcast tend to be sort of the smarter types. Um, but it'll take time for it to kind of filter through to everyone. Uh, so at the start, you know, you're talking to a more uh, kind of intelligent level person and it's kind of easier to teach them different things. Uh, but yeah, it, fundamentally it'll be then about how do they get their family on board and how do they get the next person on? Uh, but it just, it just takes time and we're just not at that point yet. Yeah. Do you have the feeling that in Australia people, I mean, this is, I, I get that confirmation from a lot of sites because in Austria, I mean, we, I'm in Austria and Vienna and people tend to be, they are, they are literally, they are more conservative, you know, more close minded a little bit, not, but conservative. Do you have the feeling that in some countries, for example, in Australia, they're more open-minded, more, you know, just more actionable? <laughs> Sort of, yes and no. Like, uh, it depends what you're talking about. I think a lot of people are still. Oh, well, I guess you, you get a mix of people, right? I mean, there's some conservatives and some kind of progressive types, right? It's yeah, you know, some people are very kind of open to new experiences and so on. I, I, yeah, I guess I don't really have any um special insight to share on that. I guess uh, I, yeah, not 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 much to add on that really. Okay. All right. So Stefan, uh, anything important that you think are, uh, uh, let me, let me ask you for, uh, before we close up here, um, what would be like the, the, the wisest advice you can, you could give to a newbie, uh, you know, from, uh, okay. You know, you want to get a skin in your skin in the game, buy a, whatever fraction of a, of a Bitcoin, a couple of Satoshis. What would you say is a full note, for example, really, really that important? Well, the way I put that is I think of it like a progression guide. So the typical progression that I've seen is people would buy their first Bitcoins, then they learn, okay, get a hardware wallet. Then they learn, okay, how do I run the full node? Then they learn, how do I connect the full node to the hardware wallet? And then getting more advanced, they might look at, okay, now do I want to do multi-signature? Do I want to do you know, other more advanced forms of things like Glacier Protocol and so on, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that, think of it like a progression and ideally you've got to put yourself on that progression ladder and then try to improve. And then eventually once you get to a point where you're reasonable yourself, then you can start basically contributing on to other people and writing your own guides, writing your own educational material, making videos, whatever it is you can do or whatever it is you can do to even go and do talks at different places to try and teach them about Bitcoin presentations. You know, these are all different things that you can do. Um, but yeah, I think fundamentally it's just a big learning journey. So it just, it just takes time. So you've just got to put you, you've just got to commit to the continual learning. Great. Well, Stefan, um, I really learned so much and I think <laughs> I'm sure my, my listeners have done too. Um, do you want to, you know, give, uh, besides, you know, your, your Twitter handle and everything, uh, anything, any yeah. other sources, resources? Yeah, so look, I think the main one is just stefanlevera.com. So if you just go to stefanlevera.com, you can find all my stuff there. So Twitter, my YouTube, uh, and the podcast, obviously. Uh, So that's the best way to find me. And my DMs are open. So if people have questions, you can just DM me. Great. So thank you so much. And I hope I'll see you at the Lightning Network conference in Berlin. Uh, you're going to be. Oh, yeah, that'll be great. I'll see you there. Yeah, 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 that would be great because I was going to, you know, uh, see you in Riga live. But we didn't have much time over there. But it's OK. I'll take everything. So, yeah. So, Stefan, thank you so much. I, we, uh, it's really a great job you're doing. You're doing a great job. It's a great service to humanity, to be honest with you. I mean, this is, <laughs> no, really, Bitcoin is evolution. We don't have this monetary evolution. I don't know what, you know. Uh, uh, but hope is not lost. So um, I'm very optimistic. So thank you again and for everything you're doing. Well, that's uh, very flattering and thank you for hosting me. All right, Stefan. Thank you so much. (laughs) Bye-bye.